Well, hello and welcome to another episode of More Perfect Marketing. It's David Bear here, and t today we're going to talk a little bit about positioning of a business and how you can show up in your business in a way that your competitors don't. There's there's a, a phrase that we like to hear prospects say when we're presenting to them, when we're talking to them uh, for the first time. And it's something along the lines of, wow, I've, I've never had a marketer ask me that before, or I've never spoken to a marketer about those things before. And I could tell just from the brief conversation I've had with today's guest before I hit record that he probably encounters that kind of reaction too. That's because John Chan is a very thoughtful, multi-talented marketer is an understatement in terms of his description of the types of things that he thinks about and does on behalf of his clients. And you're going to have a chance to see that uh, firsthand or hear it firsthand uh, as we dig into today's conversation. Um, John is joining me from the city with the best night market in North America, Richmond, BC, where I enjoy what is it? Chef Tony's uh, uh, cart or stand or what, wherever those things are. Um, and uh, probably some of the best dim sum I've had since I moved out to the West Coast uh, from New York City. So, hey, John, welcome. David, thanks for having me. That's quite the introduction. <laughs> Especially the night market part, right? Right. First time <laughs> I've had that. So, Excellent. Well, um, first, I, I would give uh, Richmond a plug because it's an awesome place to, uh, to eat and... Um, uh, second, because that's where you are. And I, and I want to talk a little bit about sort of this this uh, conversation you and I were having before we started the recording, very much about how you approach the work that you do on behalf of clients. So why don't we start by just uh, quickly outlining what your business officially does, and then we'll talk about how you do it differently. Sure. Thank you. So we're a performance marketing agency for DTC e-commerce and SaaS companies. And so primarily our bread and butter is running paid search and paid social campaigns. Um, but we think about marketing holistically. So we think about and part of that comes from being cross-trained and some of our history, uh, but we think about the full, the full life cycle of what happens from first touch for first thought about the product and service that the company has um, all the way to, you know, and tension and marketing. And so realistically, while we're doing paid search and paid social, um, we have to think about how that interplays with the landing page destination and how that interplays with the uh, email marketing retention that typically might you might see with like a larger agency, um, but we try to do this as a boutique agency, even if our core specialty is in this one area, because in practice, you as brand owners would have to think about those things holistically. So we try to solve those problems with you alongside. So, okay. Um thinking about things holistically i got to say in in my experience with most marketers is actually not the thing that they do right they they think about well you hired me to drive traffic to your site that's my job i did my job what you do with that traffic is up to you and and so already that that you know clearly differentiates you because you're thinking more about the follow up process the engagement process the how does this convert into sales and retention of of customers you didn't start in this world. You you eventually came here. So I, I want to um, uh, understand kind of the background that you have that informs your slightly different approach here. I appreciate that because I think the same way that we approach marketing for the brands that we work with, asking about their genesis and origin story, I think you will you'll see sort of the 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 thought process of how we arrived where we are today. And so if you think about the career that I had, I basically had three major arcs, right? The first part, you know, I dropped out of school when I was 19. Um, this was 2006. And so um, I started my career doing freelance web design because um, that was the skill set that I built in high school. I learned how to code. I learned, I was good at, I was good at drawing. And it was the first sort of marketable skill that I had to do freelancing. Now, mind you, when I dropped out of school, the business mechanics of school, of, of, sorry, of running a business, I wasn't very good at. And so I eventually actually ended up taking the job, ironically, back at the university that I left, right? But it was my first foray of actually doing, uh, being a web designer professionally. 
And so um, the common thread as you go into these three arcs is that the first part was being a designer. The second part was being a software engineer. And the third part was being a marketer. And these are very different uh, fields. And it's it's not easy to transition into it. But the common thread that I eventually figured out was that I was very good at going from zero to 60 and learning new fields very quickly, which meant two sides of it, which meant I was very good at learning new fields or learning about a business very quickly. And I was also very good at explaining and teaching it uh, to others about it, which is lends itself really well for, for marketing services. And so going back to the design part, um, when I first started with doing web design, um, I solved the next problem of being a web designer, which was I built this page um, that was asked of me, but who is it that I'm actually impacting on the other side? And so it led to questions around thinking about uh, user journeys and doing user research. I didn't know those labels at the time, but it exposed me to the world of usability. And when I, when I launched into that, I, I became the go-to person organization for being the user researcher. I helped them set up usability labs and I helped them figure out, you know, wasn't just a matter of us creating designs. How did it impact the people that we served? Um, but then the next problem after I did that for a while, I did, was there for about four to four and a half years. And I later realized that it was hard for that organization, the university, to value and, and appreciate the work that I did. Because no matter how great of a user experience I delivered for our end users, the organization and the business, quote unquote, didn't care and couldn't value my services accordingly because it didn't have an impact on their bottom line. And so being a great designer also meant that I had to be serving for the business as well, And which is kind of like the next skill set that I explored was how do I tie this with analytics and how do I tie this with measurable improvements? And that's kind of like how I learned a skill set around being a CRO consultant, right? I started doing A-B testing so that I wasn't just trying to make sure that the users had a better experience, but also that the business was positively impacted as well. And, and just for, for our listeners who don't know CRO, conversion rate optimization. So so what happens in terms of the engagement and activity on the website, moving people to the next stage? That's absolutely right. Yeah. And thanks for explaining that. Um, but you'll see the progression where after I did that, my um, I was I had a lucky break, actually. I was doing a bunch of consulting for different products and clients. Um, but the big break was uh, I landed a gig at 37 Signals, the people behind Basecamp, mm -hmm. popular project management software. And for the in the web design community at the time, um, they're really well known for being champions of a lot of you know forward thinking ideas at the time. Being a remote first company, um, having software as a service, bootstrapping, they had a lot of really interesting ideas that that they championed. Coming up with their own uh, programming language, Ruby on Rails, that was quite popular at the time. And so. Um, for me to join their organization to work as a conversion optimization, uh, like a, a conversion designer, allow me to see how they operated from the inside. What is it like to work for a remote company, a remote first company? How did they think? How did they treat all kinds of things that I saw and read from their books? Um, but eventually that ran its course. Um, I got let go because, you know, the specifics of it was that I wasn't, um, I wasn't a really good employee. So it comes down to it, right? But, the, but I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but it exposed me to the world of software. And so around that time when I was with the company, they invested in one of the first coding boot camps to exist, right? And so coding boot camps are a little bit more um, ubiquitous now, they're more popular. By the time it was uh, quite foreign to spend, you know, six, $8,000 over a, you know, 12 week period and go from basically nothing to becoming a, a junior developer well enough to actually be in the industry. And so it was a very uh, interesting idea at the time, but again, it fit sort of like my, mental model of learning things quickly. And so I got exposed to learning about writing software and I saw how they operated. And so when I got let go, I had this sort of path of, do I go back to consulting or do I try to write and build a software company mm -hmm. uh, or a product rather, not even a company. And so I went down the software path and I tried to be an autodidact in the same way that I did before of teaching myself and learning. And I found that part was particularly challenging because in design and webs, you see all the parts that you can publicly see, but software, you couldn't see behind the scenes. When you ended problems, it felt very isolating. And so I tried all kinds of things, went on forums, I you know went to meetups to get like problem solved. Um, but the the big break, the, that point was I joined a coding camp locally, coming back to Vancouver as a TA. And the, the motivation there was because I wanted to get access to the curriculum without being a student. And so I saw the same process over and over again. And my pitch principal was, which he bought, was, was beautiful because I told him, listen, I'm not gonna be the best programmer on your roster, but I'll be the one that empathizes with your students the most because I'm only one or two years ahead of them. So I'll know the same problem that they run into. And because of that, I can be very effective at teaching them, which I was. And so rose my ranks from there. I became one of their head instructors. 
um, still was the weak, one of the weaker programmers, but it gave me a way to really repeat the same curriculum over and over again, and it became a more formidable programmer at that point. Um, and so after that Raditz course, I went back to going back to writing software, and this is around 2016 now. So we're you know first arc of being a designer, second arc being a software uh, software developer. And then around that time, I told myself that I um, we had a product that was in the market that that uh, had a addition, um, and we had users that generally loved the product. They they would write out and they would say all kinds of positive things, but we couldn't commercialize it for the life of us. We couldn't you know get it to break even to cover our costs. And so I started consulting on the side, right, which is kind of the third arc of being an a big agency. And so when I started consulting, I was only focusing on the core problem of how do we become better at user acquisition? And of course, you know, you teach what you need to learn. And so I started focusing on finding companies that we could grow initially with conversion rate optimization back to my old hat, but eventually trying to find products and clients where we can say, Hey, you know what? Um, I'll take the ad account for that with what you're doing, seeing what you're able to operate. Um, I'll, we started doing media buying for you know at first for basically next to no money for for to get our hands like you know our feet wet, uh, but we came to pretty formidable in doing media buying slowly you know towards twenty eighteen or so, um, because that was kind of the eventual outcome that we wanted to develop, but we kind of like tiptoe into it. And so now, fast forward a couple more years, media buying and and Facebook ads and Google ads is our bread and butter, um, but that's how I come full circle between thinking about and developing professionally designer thinking about the technical aspects of marketing from being a software developer mm -hmm. to actually running marketing campaigns for um, small and, and large brands. I think there's so much in there that helps inform kind of the way that you think about the different things that you've done. I, I've heard you talk um, separately uh, around when you were working on that platform, um, Dayboard, is that what it was called? That's right. Okay. Um, that that you really were thinking around the work being very much product centric. And as you've matured as a, as a business owner, you're really thinking about sort of company culture, the, the sort of the bigger picture. And, and I wonder what's an, informed that, that transition for you and how did you start to recognize, Oh, I should also be paying attention to these other areas. You know, that's so funny you asked that because it, there was really important lessons that I, I took away from it. And I appreciate you doing that research beforehand because so for everybody else listening, Dayboard was a software product that I, I mentioned earlier. That was a company that we had strong uh, user traction, but weren't able to commercialize. So what's funny about that period was that when we're building the product company, um, I, I, I was coming and the genesis of it was that I wanted to learn how to write software and I was trying to be a product centric sort of um, uh, approach. And it also meant that I wasn't thinking about building an organization. And so somebody, and, and so at the time, I felt very pretentious about calling myself being a CEO, right? We're three, we're three freaking people, right? Like, what am I CEO of, right? And so I didn't want to be, quote unquote, like a, a entrepreneur. I just want to build great products and just get this out to people. And if something comes out of it, then we'll, be, we'll think about business, right? And sorry, in that sense. And so I think it meant that um, philosophically, when we, when we built that product and not company, it meant that I carried myself in a certain way. I was quote unquote the smartest person in the room. I would shut people down. I didn't. I wasn't very respectful in thinking about how I, I work with my team members. And you know, we we touched a little bit on this in our pre-call that I work with my wife. And so as people came in through the organization, there was a lot of self-learning that I had to learn about how do I conduct myself, how do I be a better listener, and all those type of things. And it wasn't like a like a, a quick transition. But one of the first very pivotal moments about um, why I realized that leadership and being a CEO was a blind spot for me was that I, I had a chance conversation with somebody. Um, and he basically told me that, listen, John, if you don't call yourself a CEO, you don't have to be pretentious about it. You just tell people that you're the CEO of a three-person company. But if you didn't wear that label and own it, what it meant was that you didn't know what the job description was. You didn't know how to lead. You didn't know what it meant to have a conversation with a different CEO that you could empathize with. And more importantly, you didn't know how to empower the people around you so that all the decisions didn't have to come through you. And there was a lot of ego and a lot of little things that came at play. But when he said that, it made me realize that it was a very big blind spot. And they've always, you've always seen the, 
the evidence, the writing was on the wall of like how I wasn't effective in the way that I managed people. Like I was very likable as a person, but in in, in working relationships, um, it was hard to find the right balance because you know when you're the leader of your own company, it's hard to get feedback from from organization sometimes you have to sort of like do something incorrectly and then watch how things unfolded and then you can deduce from that but there's nobody there to give you instructions right it's a very lonely job and so that was a very important sort of like pivotal moment and but that was kind of the starting point that I realized that being a great leader was an important skill to develop and I was very deliberate about learning how to what it means to lead and and how do I how do I transition from being a product-centric sort of company or business to a company-led one and I'll end this thought here with with um, another great advice that uh, a CEO that I work with now that gave me back then, which was when I shared with him that was a problem that I had about what it meant to be a great leader, what it meant to be a CEO. He told me that, Jonathan, all the skills that you brought in being building a great product can translate very well into being a great company. You just got to think about building the company and your products one step removed. As in before, you used to be the person that used to work directly on product. You would commit code changes. You would make design adjustments. You work directly on product. But now your job is to work one step removed, which means you have to bring the right people and lead them and set the direction for how they built a great product. And if you think about it in that way, it's exactly the same steps. It's exactly the same thing. You just have different tools. You'll be using meetings. You'll be using feedback. You'll be using guidance. And a lot of people realize a lot of the process afterwards made me realize that, wow, those skills were translatable because now I can give really good feedback. They feel great about it because they learn a ton and they have great opportunities to work on interesting things. And I feel great about it because I get to empower somebody to do better than where they were before they joined the organization. So it was, it was, a, it was a very important lesson for me to learn. I, I love I love that explanation, and it it makes me think of two things. It makes me think first, as you were describing the um, the shift in the kind of leader that you wanted to be and and have become, uh, a lot of the work that you see in the Jim's Col- Jim Collins books, like Good to Great or Built to Last, and about what a thoughtful, sort of a supportive, kind, generous leader um, looks like. And the, the the last point that you made um, reminds me of the whole Michael Gerber e myth um, challenge that so many small businesses have, which is that the owner or the creator is so entrenched in the business from day to day, right, that they're not thinking about how do you actually build the business the way you want it to be built from the outside and and and. To, to go back to Collins, you know, have have the right people in the right seats, um, do, you know, and so um, it, it's great that you've been through that personally, because it sounds to me like you also recognize that as you're starting to work with a client, what's going on beyond the functional activity that you're being engaged to to do, you know, on on their behalf. Absolutely. And it goes back to your your topic that you started off with, which is product and market positioning. A lot of this really comes down to if you had to take a company or product and position them in a certain way, why that one? Why? How do you come up with something that's unique for that particular company or angle? And a lot of it really comes down to what makes the founding team unique. And you know, a lot of us, again, we have all these titles and all these descriptions of what we functionally do. I'm a marketer. I'm a designer. I'm a salesperson. But when you interview people and you meet with them, what you'll find is that they all they come in all kinds of flavors, right? And and why is that? It's because, well, they may do marketing as, you know, as, professionally, but their upbringing, their hobbies, you know, the fact that they were trained as a musician or the fact that they did art, the fact that they're in athletics. If you ask any individual person that is in that um, has any type of experience in any of these fields and you ask them, hey, how does marketing impact, sorry, how does music impact the way that you approach marketing? Or how does you know being an uh, being an athlete impact the way you go about being a programmer? Every one of them will be able to tell you. It's like, oh, you know, now that you ask me, I think about it in this weird, obscure way that only I understand. But guess what? That's where originality comes from. That's where original problem solving comes from. That's where original insights come from. And that's why, if you look at a lot of interesting products or services, they often happen at the intersection of two related fields. You talked about, for example, that you do marketing agencies and, and you work with them and you work closely with them, but you also come up with a finance background. But here's the funny part. Watch where those intersect. You'll find the interesting parts usually happen 
from all the history that you've had working with finance companies to where you, you, you work with marketing agencies today that you could individually bring that somebody else could not because you have that history. And so often, more often than not, most companies or products or founders don't come with that you know, backstory, pre-packaged in a bow, ready for you to, to talk about. Mm-hmm. It's somebody that you have to uncover. But the same thing can be said of employees. And so when you talk, and this is the part where coming from like the head instructor and the formal training part comes in play, because when I'm trying to help you know students develop um, their unique strengths, oftentimes I try to figure out um, metaphors that they're already used to. And so if you bring in employees that work within your organization, they often come with these backstories that you can intersect and say, you know what, that's exactly what you got to do, but you do it in this way with this type of work. And for them, it just unlocks interest. Like, wow, I've never had anyone explain it to them before. But now that you said it, I can't forget it. There's so many things that have popped into my head and, uh, as, as you went through that story. And, and I'm sitting here looking at your website and some of the examples of some of the clients that you're working with. Um, right right on the front page of your website right now is um, some of the ads that you or the creative that you've, you've worked on on behalf of, uh, I don't know if this is the brand name or the product name, but Redhead Revolution. I'm thinking, well, gosh, there's got to be a story behind that that, you know, is connected to, to you know, what you've just been sharing. Would, would you be... Uh, uh, open to sort of walking us through that one or a different um, client yeah, story? Of course. I mean, like it, it, that's that's a good one in the sense that, you know, with that product, the founder was solving her own problem. She was basically coming up and cooking up with a, a formula for her own, but she realized that when she was shopping for makeup, that they didn't have anything that's specific for gingers. It's like, that's that's her demo. And so what happened was she didn't even have to tell her personal story. She just came from a, a need where she realized that when she couldn't find anything for herself, there has to be other people that have the same problem. And so that was one of the, it was an interesting brand because when we started working with them, um, marketing was is something that she knew she had to do, but the the mechanics of doing that, of how do you calculate your economics, make sure that it was sustainable and make sure that you can tell your story. Those things were sort of elusive. But again, it's one of those things where when you solve a problem that is so dead on that the market actually needed, the market rewards you. And, they, and, and, and the marketer's job is very easy at that point. All you have to do is just basically just reach more people, same message. And so in her case, we didn't have to do a lot of market positioning. All we had to do was just basically tell people like, hey, here's a problem that you have. This is what I found. And I'm very happy with it. And you just have to retell the customer story. And that same story, as opposed, if it's for that one brand or for others, it's all the same, which is, you know, the marketer's job is to show up to see a brand and whether if there's existing customers and whether there's existing clients. And that's why, you know, customer reviews and testimonials work really well is because other people can relate to them, but like, oh, I have the same problem too. And so for that company and that brand, the marketing campaigns were were easy to implement in the sense that it was like, it was just retelling of the same story that they were basically already like, you know, already telling. Mm -hmm. Um, But the mechanics of it, how do you do it in a scalable way? How do you do it in a way that the merge checkout, those things were or the major part of working with that particular brand. You, you, you talked about testimonials and I remember seeing something on your website about um, UGC user generated content. And uh, uh, this is a whole different um, marketing environment than I, I grew up learning. Right. I, I'm, you know, a couple of decades ahead of you and we were still doing direct mail and, you know, some of those things that are, which by the way, are it's not dead. Um, mm-hmm. But but a lot of the online stuff and the engagement of an audience as directly um, in an interactive way in marketing was a little bit more um, re- uh, slightly removed. You could, you could, you know, print a testimonial, you could put somebody's picture on there and put a quote on an ad. But these days there's so much more direct engagement. There's community that's built around uh, brands, particularly the types of clients that you tend to serve in the 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 the, the SaaS and the um, uh, the the online you know uh, uh, e-commerce space. And and I'm curious how um, it's not formulaic, right? Sometimes it fits with a client, sometimes it doesn't. And so I I wonder as your Again, you, you were, we were just talking about client story, but now, um, you know, client worldview, client um, interest in sort of how active they want to be in in engaging and building community versus doing things in an old school way. How do you approach all of that? That's a, that's that's a very interesting way to frame it, and I like the fact that you touched on direct mail because if you think about a lot of the marketing today, 
marketing as a field has been around for decades. And so the tools and the techniques and the environments may change. But fundamentally, the job of the marketer has not. How do you tell a story? How do you think about what messaging do you say in such in such a way that people to that that they that they respond well to? And so if you look at core principles, principles don't change. Right. If you look at direct response, we're still direct response marketers, just in a different medium. So instead of like doing advertorials, which you know still is a technique that people do online today, that's why I think it's 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 interesting that when you look at some media buyers today, a lot of the really good ones would pay homage to to some of the early direct response ads that you would see in in print magazines. Right. They they talk to like you know like Apple's like you know ads back in the '90s, or they'll look at you know uh, Porsche ads in in you know the '80s. And it's interesting because copyright and messaging and those things haven't changed a lot of it really comes down to how does it translate to this current world environment and so to answer your question you know when we think about media buying or when i think about training media buyers if i were to bring people into our organization i think about it on two different levels what are the principles and things that don't change because those things are timeless right buyer psychology um you know how do you catch people's attention and what the role in the job of the marketer is the the um the interplay between brand marketing versus the response and how that overlays between the the purchase cycle of a consumer that doesn't change right but the tools using remarketing here using youtube shorts using ugc using different types of tools those things can change and so i think it's a matter of breaking down what aspects of the things that you need to learn and what is and also evaluating which spark much aspects of a marketer they're good at so that they can focus on skills that don't change and also while updating on technical skills that can change over time so that they can you know once they current their market and, and and honestly as marketers or agencies we it's our job to stay on top of these type of changes but also recognizing that those things that have informed a lot of the techniques today has a certain origin and source and that we should always learn from those the, um, you're talking about changing technology, changing environment, and we're recording this right in the midst of a whole bunch of changes in the world in which y- you operate. Um, changes from the platforms, Meta and Google are are, are making some massive changes. You, I, I don't remember if it was re- remarketing, retargeting, whatever the the term was you just used. That that among other things is not necessarily going away, but changing the the, the approach to it. Um, there's changes with artificial intelligence on the platforms that you are are buying and managing media. And, and I'm curious uh, to understand from your perspective, I, I, you've already given us a hint at sort of your perspective on, on well, there's, it's, there's always foundational stuff, but um, how you help clients navigate the rapid pace at which these things are changing and something that you know, a year ago was very easy and very possible to do. And then a platform says, you know what, we're not going to, we're not going to let you, the marketer do that anymore. And suddenly you have to adjust for the new reality in which, in which you operate. Hmm. So there's a lot of nuance built into that question, because when you think about platforms, so let's talk about ad platforms in a second and the changes the directionally making. Um, directionally, if you look at marketing in the last five, 10 years, so meta meta in the in the in the grand scheme of things is a really young platform. It's only really been around for like 10, 15 years in terms of like 12, 12 years in terms of like actually 15 at this point. Uh, uh 2007 is when they started the business pages and the advertising. 100 yep. percent And so it's like if you look at that sort of model, right? Like the consumer behavior of mobile phones, right? Like 2008, people started engaging that. Like that changes rapidly, pretty quickly. And so a lot of it really comes down to looking ahead and seeing what the incentives are for these app platforms and what their business model is to anticipate how you navigate these type of changes. And so in this, in a certain sense, everybody's guessing, but you can sort of see the writing on the wall. And you can make educated guesses, right? And so, for example. If you look at both um, Meta and if you look at both Google, a lot of the product changes over the last couple of years have, you know, have a few sort of themes that have come with it. One is that they're moving across single f- interfaces and devices, right? They're integrating because data and tracking is going to be very important. So they're, you know, for 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 Google, Google has had a great advantage because of the inventory that they have across the. Multi- they have YouTube, they have Search, they have, you know, so the fact that you have a single user that's signed in that can be traceable across multiple platforms is because they have access to all of that inventory. Meta doesn't have that disadvantage, and so when you think about directionally about which which um 
skill sets or platforms that you could, you know, champion for and say, you know what, it's a good idea to like spend energy to to market in those platforms is 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 that. So when you look at say TikTok, there's certain uncertainties around, well, is that platform going to stick around? Where does the data source come from? You know, those type of things. And what's the longevity of those type of skills? And you'll see platforms come and go in terms of like popularity or attraction. And that's why for like new things like, you know, like, you know, um, you know, Elon Musk taking over Twitter, right? And X and rebranded as X. How does that impact advertisers, right? There are, there are broad implications around the direction of those things and you should tread accordingly. Um, but it also goes back to why there are certain bread and butter that's, you know, Facebook and, and Instagram and the fact that they bought multiple platforms, that's not going away. That's a safe space to be. Um, when you look at Google, safe space to be, people still need to rely on search. Um, but it all comes back to directly thinking that if these platforms are going to mature and do better as a business, part of it is also a, 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 about removing the barriers of media buyers. And so in a sense, machine learning over the last couple of years have made the job of media buyers easier. You can manage more campaigns, but in the same sense, they also made it into a bigger black box about what's actually happening behind the scenes. So you have less levers to do and so to, to control. And so it means that the um, if you look at the skill side of a media buyer, juniors, intermediate buyers, uh, intermediate buyers, um, and even the advent of AI has really removed some of the, the necessities for that. It removes some of those skills that's required because the barrier of entry is a lot lower. But senior media buyers, or even the people that are working with AI, it's like you can get ChatGPT to come with a set of copy, but you need someone with a good sense and good taste to evaluate if generated copy is something that you should use or you should modify in a certain way. And so directionally, we try to anticipate and think about wh where platforms or tools are headed and how do we respond accordingly based on what we anticipate those changes are. And it's 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 a hard thing to capture um, and be, be, be correct about, but we try to make educated guesses and make bets directionally about those type of things, which is why it's important to think about the platform changes as opposed to the timeless things that you develop as a marketer. And and, I, and I'll just add, um, you know, to bring our conversation full circle. Um, even though it may be easier for media buyers to manage within these platforms, that when uh, you know a, a client is engaging somebody like you who is thoughtful about things well beyond what buttons to push and what you know um, budget to set and what audience to target, that there's a lot more that is that is coming with that package than simply somebody managing the the tools. Um, I, I we need to wrap things up, and uh, you know, I was thinking about the um, uh, the work that you do, the agency name that you have, and the idea that it's important to never overpromise and promise something that is unrealistic. And yet, uh, I'm reminded of the the Dan Sullivan book, "10 X is Easier Than 2 X." <laughs> it is, in fact, possible that you can do a lot more than you're promising in the name of your agency, and I imagine that you do. But um, for those of you who want to get in on the joke, um, John, would you mind sharing the name of your agency and where, where they can find it? Of course. So our name is a 2x.agency, sorry, 2x growth agency. Uh, our URL is 2x.agency. The genesis was actually, was um, we used to be 2x conversion design. So our legal name is actually still conversion design built into it because that's kind of where we came from. But honestly, a lot of it really came down to just thinking about, you know, um, if you think about a lot of the organizations that engage, like product naming, I actually don't spend too much time thinking about that too much beyond the fact that people just need to understand it really quickly. When you think about brand names, you can be called Google and still build like, you know, trillions of dollars in value. Like there's, there's, it's, 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 it's um, inconsequential in that sense, but product and branding names have some aspects of it that can be helpful people when you're named, you know, PayPal or named Dropbox, when people can sort of infer what the utility of your software is, Evernote, those are all great names. Um, but otherwise, I don't too think too much about it because at the end of the day, when people are working directly, directly engaging with you. And so beyond that initial product positioning, a lot of it is really trying to uncover and figure out what our, what our narrative and story is. And so you could almost say that I didn't give it too much thought beyond that. That's just it, what it direction needs to be. Um, because I, I even back then knew that it was important to just be clear and and not clever, um, and uh, we just go from there. Excellent. Well, if folks are interested in finding you, it's easy enough. It's two x dot agency, uh, and uh, John Chan. Thank you so very much. This has been a fabulous conversation. I really appreciate you making the time, David. This is so much fun for me too. Pleasure.
Indeed. Folks, you've been listening to More Perfect Marketing. If you know somebody who could benefit from listening to the conversation you just heard, please share this with them. Until next time, my name is David Baer. Bye-bye.